So um, last week when we got together, we went through um, Ezra 3, 1 through 7. And um, as you recall from last week, um, they had built an altar, they had repented, they had got right with uh, God. And now they started to want to do their work quickly. I think this is in part because they knew as they were building, um, the temple meant God's presence. And the sooner they got the temple built, the sooner they were going to have God's presence. So they were excited to get their work started. And because they had got their, their, uh, And because they had got their um, themselves right with God, um, as we learned last week, they were at a place um, with God where um, they could now commit to building the house of God over again. It was important for them to repent first. God wants our service, but he wants our relationship first, uh, but then everything flows from there. So because they repented, it was allowed, it allowed the um, uh, heart of the people so he could work, he got the heart of the people so he could work through the people. In Second Chronicles 36, 15 through 16, just as a quick reminder of, of how they got here in the first place, having gone into captivity and, and were coming back and getting ready to, to rebuild the temple, ultimately the walls and everything years later, um, and the reminder to them in the scripture should be the reminder to us. So verse 15 says, And the Lord God of their fathers, he sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised the words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of God, a wrath of the Lord, <coughs> arose against the people, till there was no remedy. The good news is God will send warnings because he has compassion. And I find it interesting, he just doesn't have compassion here for his people, as it said here, for his dwelling place as well. I think he dug his temple. Um, but as, as we know, they mocked. And so God said, fine, I'm going to send you into captivity. Let you cool your jets for a while. Then you'll seek me again, and we'll bring you back. So now as we look to verses 8, eight through 13, we'll see that the task at hand of restoring the temple could begin. Verse 8. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the son of Josedach, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of captivity to Jerusalem began to work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. So the interesting thing here is in the second month of the second year, um, going back, um, I was able to find, and it's in 1 Kings 6, 1 and 2 Chronicles 3, 2. This was the same month and year, or not year, but same, same time frame that Solomon had initially built his temple. This is occurring about 70 years um, after the first set of Jews were sent into captivity. And then God, because he's faithful to his promises, uh, we'll see in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, he'd already promised them that they'd be coming back. He says, for the Lord, no, for th thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my great work, my great work toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me <clears throat> and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from the captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. <clears throat> so the good news for them is while, while God had sent them into captivity, it was, it was a judgment, but he sent them into captivity um, 
knowing that he meant for them to have peace and it wasn't meant for their evil and they did have a future and a hope. We also see in this verse eight um, that there is going to be a distinction of ministry as we see both workers and overseers. First Corinthians 12, 12 through 31, which we won't read right now, um, but take a look at it later. Um, this passage reminds us that there are many members and gifts within the body of Christ. We should always remember that God is the one who composed the body. He composed the body and put the body together for a specific work that he has planned. It, what he puts together at this church or at this place at this time may be different than what he puts at another place at another time for a different work. We should not be jealous of others and their callings, their tasks, or their gifts. We're all called to do different things. Um, as we see in this verse, some of them are going to do nothing but encourage. Some of them are actually going to do some heavy lifting. But all the parts of the body are necessary to complete God's work. So again, we notice uh, the Levites set forward the work by setting forward the workers. They were just kind of pointing and saying, you guys go here and you do these things. Uh, Levites in the Old Testament um, times uh, worked in the capacity of deacons in the New Testament. They had been responsible for the tabernacle in the wilderness, Solomon's temple, and were getting back to their calling. They handled the physical needs of the church, the temple, the same as deacons would today. But we got to remember that while some may not physically um, engage in the work, they can take active parts in encouraging those doing the work. If you recall reading this, there were old folks, young folks, little people, um, you know, not all of them can do the same thing. Not only that, but they weren't meant to do the same thing, but just by their physical attributes may not have been able to, that doesn't give you a free pass. You're still called to do something. You know, this place, you know, the bridge sometimes, if you can't sparkle, and that's the first ministry we look to put people in, we'll put you on, you know, we'll put you on with a prayer team and let you, let you do that because everybody should be praying and everybody can pray. It's important to note here that collectively they began to work without dispute or complaining. It said they just picked up and started to do the work. They were becoming light bearers in their community, which should be what we are about. And if you recall, when we went through Joshua, one of the reasons why God sent him to the land was to do just that. There were a lot of heathens there. God wanted his people to represent him in the, the right way to do life, if you will. Philippians 2, 14 through 15, says, Do all things without murmuring and complaining, that you become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as a light in the world. They each knew their calling. It's kind of like here, right? We got Sunday service. Think of all the ministries that are going on before Sunday service starts. During the week, there's there's cleanup, you know, there's preparation of bulletins, you name it. And then on Sunday, they they come in. You know, we've got special places assigned for uh, new people. The cones just don't get put there by themselves. As people come in, doors get open. We say hello. We got the worship team. They're already starting. They're, they're practicing. Right? They get here early. They practice. Church starts. We got people handing out Bibles. Every there's, it's kind of uh, if it's done well, it's it's orchestrated in such a way where hopefully nobody notices all the things that are going on. But there's a lot that goes into play to do things right. So hopefully, when people leave here, they won't think, "Wow, there was trash everywhere." Oh gosh, nobody smiled at me when they leave here. They'll 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 not think of anything but Jesus because everything else happened in a correct way, in an orchestrated way, such that you know they leave with true thoughts in their head about why they were here. And it wasn't to see me, it wasn't here to see you. You know, I think Pastor David let them see Jesus. I think he had on his on his um, podium. We all should do something for the kingdom in, in fellowship with him and our brothers in that work. So that's another thing, right? As we get, as we're doing work for him, we're getting to work alongside our brothers and sisters, which is, which is and can be an awesome time, usually. 
Verse 9. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel and his sons, and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God. The sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. So as the work began in verse 8, again, without issue, now we see them working as one here in verse 9. It's awesome that we see them working as a team. There is no me first mentality, not it's my idea, not his idea. No, we're going to do it my way. They knew their tasks and they got down to business working as one. Remember, uh, in, in, in humility, right? Because sometimes it's hard. Um, some of us in life may own businesses, be bosses, and when you come to this place, you may not be a boss anymore. You may not, and, and not just all the time, but in, in a specific task. You may have to take a back seat, humble yourself to do things that your other world uh, might be a little bit different than, than what you would do while you're here. Um, but God rewards and he sees our humility. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Then another example, right? Jesus, our perfect example of humility, obedience, and submission. Philippians 2.8, and being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I can't think of um, a better submission to God the Father to say, I will go to the cross. This cup can't pass from me. Um, submitting to uh, being a man for some number of years when he's God. Um, so when we say, perhaps, I might be a little bit good to sparkle, or I might be a little good to do whatever. I think if you look at that scripture, there's a, a check, or should be a check to yourself. Um, if he could do those things, I think I can clean the toilet. First Peter uh, 5, 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So how often um, when we're serving God, are we looking to be the man? Are we doing work only so somebody sees us and notices us? It is clear from that verse, if we want grace, we need to remain humble. At the end of the day, it's a matter of the heart. Check your heart. Verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priest stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of ordinance of David, king of Israel. So now it's getting kind of fun, right? Um, it's no longer just about work. They've been working, and I think it's kind of interesting. We haven't really seen the process. We just hear they started to work, and then bam, things were done. Right, there's no, this was the process, we grabbed the, the wood from here, we had to do the boulders this way, we had to lift, there's, there's none of that stuff. Um, instead, what we're seeing and learning about is the effect of the work on the people, right, because of the building that they were doing. Only the foundation at this point was finished. Their progress caused them to want to take a break from the work so they could worship and praise. Kind of reminds me, I don't think I've said this to a couple of people, I don't think I've said it from here, but I remember we were doing the build out here, and if you've heard this, if everybody raises their hand, I'll, I'll run away, but um, when we were doing the build out here, we had to build the stage, and building the stage wasn't fun. I don't know if you've noticed, it's not square, right? It's rounded, and if you've ever been underneath it, there's a lot of metal, um, I'm looking at builders in the room and I, I don't know the names of all the stuff underneath there, but it had to be framed and uh, it wasn't easy. And there were probably about five or six of us, and I remember who all was, was underneath there at this point. I know Big Larry was underneath there, which was kind of fun because you guys know Big Larry, dude's a monster and he fit under there. But um, working on it, 
and having to move things and nope, that's not it. Trying to trying to get it to where it, it was was going to be even. Um, it was a nightmare. But the cool thing is, we finally got that finished. And that night, we took a break. And that was the night that Pastor David came here, and it was the first night he actually got to stand on that stage. And there was, I don't know, two, three hundred people maybe that came to, to see that. I don't know, you know, some people are not, they probably remember the event. I don't remember how many was here. I don't remember, I do not remember if we sang songs or not. I'm saying yes, so we did. So, right, we took a break from the work to do what they did, right? It's not all about the work. We're, we're going to enjoy the process. We're going to enjoy where we are. And isn't God good that he lets us all be involved in the work? And then we can take a step back saying, isn't he good? And then in this instance, right, we got, we were building the stage for a reason for pastors to stand on it and, and proclaim truth. And that was the first night. So um, I think that's kind of the same thing we're getting here um, with these guys. So it wasn't just... Um, some folks um, worshiping, so everybody that was involved at the task, right? They all took part in, in the worship. They were very work. They were very moved in the worship, and perhaps um, they were recalling their uh, complacency and rebellion against God, which led to the seventy years of judgment and captivity. Um, realizing that, wow, you know, we've come a long way. God's taken us back. We're building the foundation. Stop. We know what's coming. Let's praise, let's praise God for, for what he's doing in our midst. Sometimes like them, we need to take a break from um, all the business and what we're doing. Just praise, worship, and spend time with Jesus. Because at the end of the day, it's about relationship, not about what we're doing. Um, we can see, uh, we sometimes get too busy, and then we lose sight on the goodness of God. at the end of the day it's him it's him that works through us right so so the last thing i think on, on this too when you know we'll see that they were weeping and crying some of them were going crazy with joy and everything uh, i think for for some that well all right had come out of captivity um, i think they were you know, i think we can't forget to be thankful for where we were and where we are no longer. Um, and I think that's part of it too. I think they're, they're seeing the foundation and it's like, wow, isn't this cool? We're no longer in captivity. We're, we've got the foundation. We're about to have the temple and for them, temple meant presence of God because that's, that's, that's how it works for them, right? We get the Holy Spirit in us. That's not what happened for them. So they needed their temple. Verse 11. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. <clears throat> so they were worshiping, praising and giving thanks because they were realizing the goodness and mercy of God toward them, right? Um, I think it's clear that they were pretty stoked about what they were doing and about where they, where they were. We should be getting excited about the things of God. We should be getting excited about the goodness of God. We should be getting excited about the forgiveness of God. Uh, we should be excited that God has a plan and we get to be part of that plan. We should be excited for truly, just as they sang, he is good for his mercy endures forever. Are you too busy to praise? Do you forget? Do I forget? Um, to praise out of uh, thankfulness in the goodness of God. How often do we just forget to be thankful? Um, we've earned it. Because we're a good boy or girl, um, we should get something. Um, not necessarily. Um, sometimes God's good to us just because he's good, right? In Psalm 135 and 136, we obviously won't read that. Um, but my guess is, and, and read these, read these passages, 
my guess is that some of the thoughts in those um, those two chapters were in their mind related to the goodness and kindness of, of God and I would not be surprised if that was kind of some of the responsive um, uh, singing that they were doing talking about and, and thinking on on the goodness of God Titus 2 4 through 5 says but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared not by the words of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us so he brought the children of Israel back to him as he brings us into a relationship with him as well Psalm 73 1 says truly God is good to Israel and is and because we as Christians are grafted in we can claim this verse for ourselves too and say truly God is good to us as well so they're making a joyful noise why they've gone from the land of kept being in the land of captivity and judgment for 70 years and now they're back the return to the land was special to them because this was the place by virtue over the temple God would once again be with them their relationship was now being renewed we too should be we too should be singing the praises sing praises because of what God has done for us because while we were once captive to sin by virtue of our acceptance in Jesus we now have a relationship with God verse 12 but many of the priests and the Levites and heads of the father's houses old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud <clears throat> with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes yet many shouted aloud for joy what do you think the old men were weeping were they weeping and crying because they thought that the new temple would not compare to the, the original temple? Were they weeping and crying out because they remembered their sin was the cause of destruction and being sent into captivity in the first place? If you read about Solomon's temple, you will see it was pretty, a pretty incredible place. A lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort went into building it only for it to be destroyed because they had a lot of stupid moments. Those that knew uh, the opulence of Solomon's temple probably understood or thought that the one that they were about to build would not be as grand as the one that, that was there previously. If they were dwelling on the past and what on the past and what was their sin, I think a better, better approach um, would have frankly have been to be thankful for where they are and were now, which was returning. Hebrews 8 12 where I will be merciful to the unrighteousness in their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more like them um, we should be cautious of, of comparisons so yeah they probably were right weeping in part because um, they're remembering their sins we should be cautious when um, We should be cautious when we're remembering the sins that we came from, right? Um, we can use the past as a testimony. We can use the past to motivate uh, and continue on our journey. But if we allow the past to drag you down like a boat anchor, I would say that's not a good thing. Um, and for sure, we don't allow the past to be put in your face by your enemy, the devil, to condemn. So if you're feeling condemned by your past, God's a forgiving God, so if you go and repent and you get repentance and you're remembering it in a condemning way, that's not at all from God. Don't let regret stifle your walk. All of us probably have some things in our past that we can hold against ourselves. If Jesus doesn't hold it against us, who the heck are we to hold it against ourselves? Right? He can forgive us. I think it's only right that we can we can probably figure out how to forgive ourselves. I'm sure it may have been our fault, but after repentance, we're walked white as snow. 
So then we had another group here, right? That was that was the the older people, and then we had another group, the young people, right? Um, this whole temple thing was new to them. They had never seen a temple before. They just knew they were building a temple. They probably heard about the old one. But they didn't really have anything to compare. Um, kind of see these guys as, as, or these people as new believers. Um, they were about to experience the presence of God in a way they hadn't before. And I think they were pretty excited about it. They weren't thinking about what they had lost. Um, they were only thinking on and seeing what they were about to gain. So this could be a reminder to us that are older in Christ, which is we need to be careful our actions don't discourage the younger Christians. Um, and in this instance, if you read um, many shot her for joy, I don't think it, I don't think it did. Sometimes I think it's cool that youth can carry us. Verse 13. So the people could not discern the noise of the shout of the joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shot her with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. So if their sounds are in, of joy are heard or fall off, I think they were they were pretty loud. Um, and while that's an awesome thing, I think you know we'll see as we get into chapter four and beyond that other people, the enemies um, of Israel of God, heard this as well, um, and they were going to come up against them to try and get in their way. Uh, the good news for them, even with the enemy to come up against them, um, they. Um, They knew that, that God was formed. This was part of the plan. They, they were sent back from captivity for a reason. Um, so at the end of the day, if God's for them, right, who can be against them? <clears throat> That's talked about in Romans 8.31. It says, what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So your exuberance and your acts, frankly, I mean, I'd say exuberance, right? Praying, you know, I, I, I've heard and seen people pray at lunch and somebody get ticked off that they're having to listen to a, a prayer. I would not even say that's exuberant, right? We're just following instructions to, to pray. But even just doing simple things like that and following God to say thanks for, 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 um, for lunch or for dinner, Will cause people to, to come against us um, potentially. Keep walking. We're supposed to do. What we're supposed to. We're supposed to do. What we're supposed to do. But we should we should be prepared, um, knowing that this is not our world, right? So um, we can't expect to get along and everything that we do be appreciated by others that that don't know Jesus. So while we may not. <laughs> Well, we may not be at work shouting for joy because that might be annoying. Um, I'm wondering sometimes if you're walking around, if people even know that you have any type of joy for anything. Um, again, I wouldn't recommend shouting because that might get you in trouble with your boss. But, you know, people should know we're different, right? Um, they should just know there's something different about you, you know. You can be joyful even when things aren't great, such that you're not happy about it. But there's a difference, right? Happy is what's going on right now. Joy is just something that we get. We're promised. We're promised joy, not promised happiness. So ultimately, God was at work in their midst. So for those weeping, did they not recall God's word to them about the temple? Because again, I think, remember, I, I, I think they were, golly, the temple is really, really cool. And, and now, eh, maybe not so much. The Haggai 2.9 said, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. Um, what words do we forget? What promises of, of God do we forget? So ultimately, their uh, return was a restoration of relationship and God allowing them back into the promised land. After sin, we too can repent and we too can be restored to a relationship with God. 
They cannot be frightened. They cannot be frightened away from their religion, nor should we be frightened away. I'm using religion, but it's really we shouldn't be frightened by our relationship because we're not in a religion. We're practicing a relationship right with God. We saw that the fear of man drew them, as it should, us to a closer relationship with God, looking for His protection. I think God uses fear sometimes because if we think we've always got it going on, um, we know how to do everything. Um, nothing can ever come against us. It's, you know, we have all the money and you name it, right? Whatever your safety net is. Um, I think sometimes in our weakness when we get fearful, God will use that as an opportunity to, to come alongside and show he is the one, right? I get a trip out of, you know, people like, well, I've got all this cash, right? And I'm money's hit. Well, just with healthcare now, right? You have a bad sickness for a couple of months. I don't care how much money you got. It's done, right? So thankful I'm healthy. We should be thankful we're healthy. And we're not thankful for the cash that we've got, although that's awesome. Um, we're thankful for who provides it and who will let us potentially keep it. <clears throat> so we also see that um, with the worship that they had, um, it was really out of a relationship with God. Um, people only really come alive um, as they accept Jesus and we become who we really are and what we're meant to do. Um, and we're called to good works. But again, they only really come into play um, in a positive way, such that we'll get um, you know, we get rewards and get credit for them, for lack of terms, if they're done while we're in Christ. Ephesians two ten says, "For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them." So, what is what is my calling? What is what is your calling? How is your relationship with Christ? And then we should be excited. Um, for the here and now and the opportunities that will be presented to us. <clears throat>